طبعا عشان نتكلم على خير حاجه بنعملها كتير جدا ما نقدرش نقول كل المانجمنت احنا هنحاول بس نعمل فوكس على حاجات بتقابلنا فيري فيري In failure of trivia, it can be ignored and uncommon condition. Failure of trivia certainly can be defined as a failure to achieve target audience. Failure may lead to several things. In the most immediate, I will have some excessive fibrosis, fibrosis under the ventral fibers, I will over the sclera flap, I will go over the sclera nosa, intrastheme. Insisted blood, طبعا كلنا بنشوفها كتير. Second ring بيكون حادثة أو حرج مشان قبل ما كتير كلها لكن هنحاول نلمسها بس. أهمها طبعا إنه مسكر بيكون سيركل أويل فيه من الأرض. الدايموست كتيرز بتاعتنا الحقيقة كتير بالنسبة لي. الـ IOP طبعا Assessment of the Dead وهنحاول نتكلم عليها بتفصيل شوية. Curiosity Essential. The visual field with images and the general progression of the coma is very detective. UBM and the anterior segment of OCT border on how we name it alone highlight of the heart of the moon. In options, we are going to actually name it management of the field of the brain. Our head and the name of the function and already present brain. The head of the machine will be the meeting where the mind to listen. وهنشوف فيديو كده ازاي الايديال ميتنج بتقسم. الاوستيان فيري كومن ان هو يبقى مقفول وفيري كومن ان احنا ما بنعملش بنيوستي وبالتالي ما بنبقاش خاصنا السبب ولو انت شفت ان الاوستيان مقفول ومجرد انك فتحته بجهاز ليزر فيري سمول سيشن هتلاقي انك حليت جزء كبير قوي من المشكله. طيب الاوستيان مش مقفول وانا عندي فين؟ عندي وان اوف تو اعمل تراب ريفيجن للتراب القديمه دي او اعمل تراب في مكان جديد. الحقيقه انا بالمناسبه برضو ان احاول اخلص بسرعه عشان سياده الرئيس يتيح ان يبقى في فشل واسئله لان يمكن يكون في اراء اخرى غير الاراء اللي انا بقولها الموضوع مش موضوع اراء الموضوع موضوع ستاديز وايه الموست سكسسفل في الستاديز. يبقى يا اما اعمل تراب ريفيشن للتراب القديمه يا اما اعمل تراب جديده يا اما الجا للتيوب سيرجري في حالات السكندري كوما ده موضوع طويل جدا الناس كنا بنتكلم فيه مع الدكتور محمد حسام المشكله الرئيسيه في حالات السيليكون اويل ان انك تفضي السيليكون اويل تفضي السيليكون اويل انت شخصيا ولا جراح الفيتروليتر هنتكلم فيه اخر اوبشن عندنا ان احنا نعمل سايكل اللي هو السايكل ده. دي سلايد انا استعرضتها من الدكتور دكتور عادل عبد الشهيد. اللي على اليمين دي دي تينر سيست او انسيستد بليب او انكابسوليتد بليب زي ما احنا شايفين البليب بقت ريستريكتد لفيري سمول اريز في فلويد اه في ايبوس لكن ستيل ما هياش بالفلويد ما هياش ما هياش بالايبوس 
ده الاي بي سي نيرا فايبروز اللي احنا اتكلمنا عنها في الكلينيك بتاعتنا وده الانترا سكليرا فايبروز يعني هنا الفايبروز تحت الكونسيبايبر وهنا الفايبروز جوه السكليرا نفسها كلينيكالي ده الاي بي سي نيرا فايبروز دي سلايد بتاعتكم بتبقى بعد العرض دي الفينال سيستم هنا البيم بتاع بتلاقيه ماشي ستريت وبعدين يغير يبقى كده تعرف كده انك انت عندك سيستم كبير الليميت بتاعها واقف عند النقطه دي دي ممكن تبقى ديفيوز صحيح لكن الفايبروز كتير قوي والكورك سكرو ابييرنس بتاع الفيسلز واضح لحضراتكم وانس انك تلاقي الكورك سكرو ده اعرف ان في ابيسكليرال فايبروز احنا هنا بنتكلم عشان ده مهم قوي ان احنا نشخص السبب. Is there anyone who doesn't speak Arabic? I'm sorry. So this is the difference between an episcleral fibrosis and tenon cyst or insisted blood. This is the procedure of the choice needed. Here, the needle is under the conjunctival, dissecting the episcleral fibrosis with very great caution. Bleeding is apt to, to occur, don't, you don't mind. What's important is the movement of the needle. The needle should move from the limbus away. From the limbus away. At a point, this is also a video of the Professor Adams. At a point, You need to go inside the anterior chamber, otherwise your apus will not be under the conjunctival. I'm going to repeat this story. You see, he is inside the anterior chamber. Going inside the anterior chamber is essential, and a good sign is that you feel that apus is percolating from the anterior chamber. Under the uh, Now we go to the other side and start the session until he joins the original medium side. Sometimes you add to this injection of an anti-metabolite at six o'clock on the other side. Now, until the second OCT occupies a very good place in diagnosis. You see, this is your case, this is your blood, and this is your iridate. Well, what you get is that the blood is very shallow. You see, this is only what you have. So you need this tool almost for like an IUDM, but until you say OCT has got a point is that you can move your section wherever you want, like this. You see now I have moved my section and now this is the shallow blade or the fibrous blade. Different sections you can see. You can choose whatever you want to get a complete picture of your failing blood. Now we move to the other option. We do an overdrive. This is my case. You start the setting under the conjunctiva. You will see the old blood. Here you have to identify the blood cautiously. If it's blue, this means a thin clear. And your technique will not work. You have to put a six clear or relatively six clear to allow the dissection of the flag. This is the original flag. Now this is scratch and the posterior edge of 
can be speed up to that. The patient's life is very essential in this step. And we go inside and use a psychodiasis epida or Now it was a speculating here. We make sure that we are inside the anterior chamber. You see the impulse is percolating from the posterior edge of the previous plane. Next step is to put an origin in wrong, with mycomycin, where whichever antimetabolite you want to use. Simple tutoring of the hepatitis is going to work. And this is my technique, or my preferred technique to do. Why I didn't do a vertical incision? Actually, this sclera is a very fibrotic, fragile sclera. So I will avoid hypotony by making just a scratch at the posterior edge of the posterior of the previous plane. Next choice is to put a tube. Whichever tube you, have going, you are going to use, you need a spiral flare. The key point here in a tube, this is an express tube. The key point is that when you dissect, you should reach the spiral spur and go somewhat inside the hole here. I'm, I'm apologizing for the quality of the picture, but now it's going to be good. Here is the spiral spur. And this is the body. This is the site of insertion of the suppress. You have to fill the anterior chamber, the anterior chamber with this elastic. Insert a needle to make an ostium for the suppress. This is the suppress. I found that the, the ostium is not enough. I did then you put your express here at the sphere spur. This is the express. You see the foot plate of the express and inside, uh, under the sphere flat. And this is the foot inside the interior. It's an easy technique, actually, but it's quite expensive. What about the literature? The literature, most of the literature approved that the same type of method blood revision is a safe and effective technique to control IOP, prevent further visual loss in patients with spirit blood. So visiting the same side or doing the other side is as equal to each other. Although I know I know that this may not be uh, applied by many people. For refractory cases, my preferred choice is to do cyclodialogue. This is the original cyclodialogue that are most available now. This is the application. I'm not going to explain the technique, but studies have shown that slow coagulation technique, or what we call the non pop technique, described by Gasterman, is the most effective in brown eyes. The power is 1,200 and the duration is 4,000 milliseconds. This is the most safe technique. Now there is a new modality, the micropulse. They claim success rate of 75%, reduction of 
I will eat the twelve millimeter mercury after one month, after twelve months. This modality is claimed to be safe and claimed to be the least destructive to the ciliary body as shown here by this electromagnetic slide. The message to take home. Proper assessment to identify the cause of factors is essential. Recent imaging techniques in many situations are essential. Crap redo or a second crap are as equal. Trap redo or second trap is as equal in regarding efficacy. For refractory cases, tubes may be the solution. When to use a tube, this is another subject, a very long subject to be discussed later. The issue is trap versus tubes versus traps. I know that Professor Hussam might have an opinion. I would like to listen to his comment. In refractory cases, cycle the load. Especially in the recent modalities, can be resorted to even in seeing light. An important information is that cyclodiode is not totally restricted to non seeing eyes. It can be used especially in the new modalities. Thank you for your attention. دكتور محمد سعد موجود؟ The topic of my talk today is about the role of cataract dissection in the management of glaucoma. In spite of the fact that the association of glaucoma is multifactorial, still the main line of therapy is to lower the intraocular pressure to the end of certain between someone and in the stroke. These therapeutic options in glaucoma benefit glaucoma. We have medications, however, the medications have side effects like ocular surface disease, skin pigmentation, periodontis, and systemic side effects. Laser therapy is another option in the management of glaucoma. However, whether laser iodotomy or laser periodontoplasty may be associated with, associated with uveitis or cystoid macular bleeding. Surgery also is successful, but it has many complications like cataract, hypotony, maculopathy, cystoid, macular edema, and even we have to redo and redo another surgery. So, therapeutic options in glaucoma includes medication, laser tablicoplasty, canal plasty, and the new techniques like stabilicone or endocyclopoch coagulation, trabeculectomy, and tubes. What is the role of cataract, just cataract extraction in the management of glaucoma? How it fits in these therapeutic options? That is what we are going to discuss in the next 10 minutes. The question is, has cataract, does cataract extraction has a role in lowering the intraocular pressure? We are going to answer this. The answer is yes. And in the literature, we are going to see that 
just at the construction of the new into a condition. Not only in angle fusion and coma, but in open angle and coma also. How better extraction helps lower the range of the fish? First, by increasing the drainage of angles, like the primary angle closure glaucoma, and as we are going to see later, also in primary open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. Also, cataract extraction helps lower the range of ocular pressure in cases of secondary glaucoma due to cataract, like trachomorphic glaucoma, tracholytic glaucoma. Even in pseudo exploration of the coma, as we're going to see later, cataract dissection can lower the range of the pressure. And the closure of the coma, there are several evidences for the literature. One of conclusion is that primary fatal massification plus intraocular lens implantation for controlled chronic angle closure of the coma or primary angle closure seems to be a safe and effective method in reducing the range of blood pressure. This procedure might become the first treatment of choice for controlled chronic angle closure of coma or primary angle closure with patients. Another study shows that when chronic angle closure of coma is associated with visual significant pattern, pectoral multiplication and procedure chamber IOM implantation alone can significantly reduce the trauma. As we see the new classification of pathogenesis of angle closure glaucoma, the third one is lens induced, and that's what we're talking about today. However, most of glaucoma surgeons do cataract surgery. When doing cataract, an angle closure will face with several difficulties. First, shallow anterior chamber. To avoid it, we can use cohesive viscoelastic, like human pipe, avoid fatal surge, and by manual IV. If we have positive posterior pressure, usually we monitor to the patient before the surgery is half an hour. If still, we can do posterior scrotomy and even ejector. Iris prolapse is common in these cases, especially if the man using tosmolem or anything to prostate. We can avoid it by doing anterior incisions, means slightly in the cornea, which will make the, diff the pecum more difficult, but lessens eyes collapsed, and do long track paracentesis. Also, we have the problem of poor pupillary dilatation. This could be overcome by several ways. Pupil stretching, this is great with hernia, and pilot pupils. Well, pilot pupil is not available now, but when it was available, it was a help during the cataract surgery in the patient with chronic pilot pupil. Avoid stretches in patients with alpha blockers or shallow anterior chambers. We can use iris swoops, it is great with shallow chamber, complex cases, and in the cases when we expect extracapsular conversion, avoid the patient with blood because it will damage the deep. Nayubian rear is available in Egypt, however, however, it's expensive because it is disposable. It is great with alpha blockers and lamp fissures. Avoid if you're doing an extracapsular or expecting extracapsular at the shaft. The power and interest and in complex cases. Also, for the difficulties in angle closure, previous acute attack, which will lead to zonular or an elucidial compromise before the cataract surgery. Estimating the power of the IO IO by matching is difficult. We have to use lemma, lemma, it's lemma, the lemma, it's lemma, the use the edge formula, which is offer for base. However, we need the problem when you have, if you have a patient with plus 6 or plus 7 hypermetropy, and you're going to do cataract surgery or angle closure glaucoma, you have to do the other eye because you'll be faced with the problem once of anisometric. Primary angle closure, several studies show that intraoperative pressure reduction was proportional to preoperative IOP. The highest preoperative intraoperative pressure decreased the most and the lowest in decreased life. One year intraocular pressure reduction was sustained for 10 years, and we've seen that in patients of all ages. The IOP reductions were similar to previous reported reductions in non contrast eye, indicating that the aging crystalline lens will be a major cause of ocular hypertension and glaucoma, and that pectoral classification with IOM 
with early plantation, we have the belt and heat oven input. This was known since the teens that cattle extraction and irrigation will not with a hand of closure, more location to the office patient. It reduces the interoperable by average, interoperable pressure by average 2 millimeter here. What is recently found in the past 10 years, that 2 millimeter, this is the average. But some patients, the interoperable pressure will be lower by 10 and even 15 millimeter mercury. I'm speaking about open handed lymphoma, just by cataract extraction. The higher the pressure, the lower, the more reduction of interoperable pressure. Another study concluded that in open handed lymphoma eyes, FACO IOL is associated with a significant decrease in interoperable pressure with less irrigation. Here's an interesting observation. We all know about ocular hypertension study group. The ocular hypertension study group, this brought patients with ocular hypertension, some were randomized for medical treatment and some for follow-up. And they found how many patients will develop lymphoma. During this study, several patients which did not receive treatment has undergone cataract extraction. None of the cases which has done uh, cataract extraction developed lymphoma. So one of the the groups concluded that treatment of ocular hypertension is cataract extraction. I know this is extreme, but some people believe it. As we said, removal of cataract can remove the, remove the causes of glaucoma, like in papillotic glaucoma, papomorphic glaucoma, and pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. When to do surgery for Super exfoliation. The patient has super exfoliation cabinet and super exfoliation glaucoma. Whether stage or combined. Most of the surgeons do FACO first because FACO alone lowers the interoperable pressure by about 2 millimeter mercury. But however, be aware of the interoperable pressure spikes. That is, after the first the interoperable pressure rises. With the several factors. So whenever you do cataract alone in patients with pseudo exfoliation and lipoma, monitor the interoperative pressure carefully in the first few days. Here what I said in the beginning, does cataract extraction alone cure the lipoma or helps in lower the interoperative pressure? In these two slides, in the upper slide, the upper slide are before cataract extraction and the lower slide is after. In the Picture of the pupil, you see dominant material present at the edge of the pupil. After cataract, it disappears. In this UDM picture, you see dominant light material in the angle. After cataract, it disappears. So, theoretically, most of the dominant present in pseudo solution come with the lens. As we know, all more it comes from different parts of the eye, but mostly of the lens. By removing the lens, we at least diminish one factor of the lipoma. When we have pseudo exfoliation, most of the lymphoma surgeons are faced with pseudo exfoliation cases, and most of them have cataracts. So, either we do them early or refer them to a cataract surgeon if we don't do cataract surgery to remove them early. Because cataract worsens with age, cataract becomes denser, the dilatation is reduced, the limbs weaker, and the glaucoma worse, that means higher intraoperative pressure spikes. Examine for there are a lot of patients with pseudo exfoliation who does not have glaucoma, but expect it to happen at any time. So any patients, any visit, you must examine the intraoperative pressure, see how much the pupil dilates before the surgery to be preferred. Most of the patients with pseudo exfoliation are also are delivering to max, and expect angle closure, because sometimes pseudo exfoliation, the glaucoma is angle closure. So during the surgery, when you dilate the pupil, you will be confronted that they are, they are weak the nerves and even subluxation. We have several problems in pseudo exfoliation, mostly like angle closures, small pupils, weak the nerves. If the patient is in the coma, there will be intraoperative pressure spikes after the surgery, which will damage the already damaged optic disc. And if you wait too long, this bones is difficult to extract. Common complications with Cataract and pseudo exfoliation, capsule rupture, zonal dialysis, visual loss, 
and what happens when you dig down, which you increase the duration of arthritis after surgery. Need of the operative complications, we also expect from uh, serious condition, spontaneous intraoperative dislocation within the capsule of death. All of us doing cataract surgery in uh, solution, sometimes they are faced with this problem later on. We then have to transfer to the retina surgery. Thank you for your attention. 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 Thank you for your بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل سنة وحضراتكم طيبين بشكر أستاذة الدكتورة دلال الشوقي والدكتور سموات على دعوتي إن أنا أكون معاكم النهاردة. مايتوك ويل بي أراوند هايلايتنج سام أوف ذا ديفرنشال ديجنوزيس أوف برايمري أوبن هاند جلوكوما. أكشلي إف وي تراي تو ميك أن ليست أوف ذا ديفرنشال ديجنوزيس أوف برايمري أوبن هاند جلوكوما إتس أن إتس أ هول ستيب ليست إتس أ فيري لونج ليست. أكشلي إت شود بي ديفرنشيتد فروم أوبن هايبرتنشال or normal tension glaucoma, <coughs> primary angle closure glaucoma, medium special, and other secondary uh, open angle glaucoma, surgical cutting, and even funny disc like in malaria or other disorders. But I will confine my talk about the three main differential diagnosis of the primary open angle glaucoma, which have an impact on treatment, which can prevent further deterioration of the visual function. My first Topic is neovascular glaucoma. I know it's very difficult to accept that neovascular glaucoma is a differential diagnosis of the primary open angle glaucoma. But I am not talking about this one. I am talking about this one. When you face this case in your clinic, sometimes you miss such small vessels at the edge of the pupils. Sometimes they are very fine and obscured by the uh, different uh, coordinate edema or the minute, minute inflammation which accompanies these cases in early. But at this stage, you can manage your biosis. You can do PRP and uh, get rid of the new vessels, which are the main trouble, and the ischemia, which is a predisposing cause. So, this is the early stage of rebiosis, which you need to detect early and to interfere early. Definitely, we know the etiology of rebiosis. It's generally the three main. Causes are proliferative diabetic retinopathy, central retinal vein occlusion, and then other venous occlusion, ocular ischemic syndrome. Others are included in a large series: ischemia, tumors, and inflammation. This is a, a table which should guide us for the management. But actually, management of rebiosis is primarily to get rid of the new vessels and get rid of other formative substance released from the still segment. And the most efficient is pan-retinal photocoagulation. You can use anti-vision, but anti-visions are temporary measures. They can't get rid of the new vessels for long, forever. So you need to do early PRP when the vision is still reasonable, when your, your view of the fundus is still clear, you can do PRP. You, you can supplement with intravitreal anti-vision, but the main line still is to do PRP. Then you will depend on the visual prognosis of the case, whether to do medical therapy as a temporary measure or to interfere with trabeculectomy. And actually, if this is disappear early, it might be reversed. And in Lansing, I, as Professor Dr. Dr. Hamraoui said, you can use cyclovirulation uh, as a structural procedure to lower the In the meantime, you should use, uh, use uh, cyclovirulation and steroid drops to get rid of the inflammation and the pain. The stages of neovascular glaucoma starts with the pre-glaucoma stage. And in this stage, you just see small tufts of new vessels at the edge of the pupil. Very rarely, they appear first at the angle as a reddish discoloration of the angle, but usually start at the edge of the pupil. 
then you begin to develop a membrane which will obstruct the outflow facility. And lastly, the end stage, which is a fibrotic membrane which pulls the protons iris against the angle and close the angle in a zipper like fashion. Uh, one point of interest here is to mention is if you come to this stage, advanced glaucoma, advanced lobiosis, obstructing the angle with pressure, pressure which is not 60 to 70 as we expect in these cases, consider the ocular ischemic syndrome in your differential diagnosis. This is the only case with established, complete occlusion of the angle with pressure which is not very high. Because of the perfusion pressure, which produces the equus, is diminished as well, which will affect the equus secretion. Definitely, we come to the treatment, as we mentioned, reduce the amount of viable retina or decrease the uh, ischemic stimulus by PRP, photocoagulation, medical therapy, anti vegif and mitomycin C. Or cyclodiaphyl coagulation. Okay. Next point is pigment dispersion syndrome. This syndrome is characterized by pigment dispersion from the obscure surface of the iris to be deposited along the anterior segment and even in the posterior surface of the zonules at the junction of the vitreous and the zonules. The trouble is that occurs in young patients. And it is in, it have an intermittent course. They appear and disappear. The Gutenberg splinter may appear and after a few weeks it, it doesn't exist. Second point is that it's reversible early. You can manage to prevent the, the shedding of the pigment dispersion early. Otherwise, permanent damage occurs to the particular network and you can't do anything else except managing the second degree glucose. There is an item which is called burning out a pigmentary glaucoma. Actually, with age, the pupil size becomes smaller and the thickness of the lens larger, so rubbing of the posterior surface of the iris against the anterior capsule of the lens diminishes. This prevents release of the pigment dispersion and the syndrome begins to disappear and the case stabilizes. And it's actually one of the differential diagnoses of uh, normal tension glaucoma. There are some forms of secondary pigment dispersion, like IOL, when it's positioned in the sarcas, may rub against the posterior surface of the iris and cause pigment shedding, angle recession, and iris cyst. Signs of the pigment dispersion syndrome, we need to look at these signs carefully because they may be started during the early stages. And early stages are the stages which be, might be reversible if interfered with the this occurs in young myopic cases during accommodation or blinking the iris pose severely and drops against the anterior surface of the capsule releasing the pigment. First sign is transillumination defect. Transillumination, transillumination fit can be seen only if you use a very bright light, very small beams through the pupil, and you be dark adapted. You need to lower the light of the room, ambient light, and look at this transillumination defects here. Definitely it is easier seen in uh, light blue eye rays, but you can see it in the high pigmented eyes if you use this procedure. Just very bright light, very small beam, and dark adaptation. <laughs> Second is Gutenberg's spindle due to the position of the pigment cilia of the iris along the obscure surface of the cornea, and this is caused by the currents which occur in the anterior chamber leading to the position of the pigments along the two surfaces here in the characteristic distribution. And actually, Krotenberg uh, spindle may disappear. You can get it for some time after exertion, some uh, exercises or vigorous exercises. You get a lot of pigment dispersion and the position of the two surfaces of the body. Then, few weeks later, it disappears completely and you can't get it easily. Sure, you need to interfere at early stages before, before permanent damage occurs to the uh, outflow facility and the particular nature. Here you can see the mechanism during accommodation. 
there is a large area of water, it means that the sphere surface is very sweet, where we build the dark pigmented exterior cells, and the anterior surface is the capsule. This and the zonules is in some time, and this releases the pigment which is deposits in the anterior surface, including the capillary measure. Here, another sign which should be looked for carefully because it doesn't appear easily. It's a chain stripe or the entire line. It's actually a deposition of the pigment which is dispersed along the anterior along the zonules and the sphere surface itself. And this could be seen except if you dilate the patient very well and look at the periphery of the uh, lens capsule. Here, another sign is pigment reversal. We know that. Usually, the trabecular mushroom is pigmented inferiorly more than superiorly. Here, because of the currents which carry the pigment epsilon, it is deposited superiorly more than inferiorly, which is called pigment reverse. Here, this is that point. The, the, the management is different from primary open angle glaucoma. We don't need to wait till the pressure rises and then we begin to manage. There is a very elegant study done by uh, Stephanie uh, Gandolfi in Italy. This gentleman has designed a very good study. He had a large number of eyes, and they were randomized for PI iridotomy as a prophylactic measure or not. And he identified eyes at high risk of developing pigmentary glaucoma. These eyes which will develop pigmentary glaucoma are characterized by pressure rise following use of the phenyl effluent. Use the phenyl effluent drops as a challenge for the pressure uh, elevation in this case. And he shows that using PI early in the stage before the pressure and turning and damage of the particular network occurs, PI was uh, capable of reducing the risk in high risk groups. He defined the high risk groups with high pressure response to fly heparin, and when they were treated with laser peripheral aerodotomy, this risk came back to the average normal cases which have uh, no predisposition for the second level. <coughs> of course, laser capitoplasty is effective in these eyes, but due to the pigmentation, they have pressure spikes post -op. So you need, if you do laser capitoplasty in these eyes, you should be careful about these pressure spikes. Next is the plateau iris or the plateau iris configuration, both in your this is another case which usually I face. They are misdiagnosed. They are treated as a primary open angle glaucoma. They don't respond pro properly to the treatment. And actually, the pressure in this group is very high. It's not 20, it's 30s, 40s, even with treatment, because they have actually they are a narrow angle glaucoma. They have no pupillary block like narrow angle glaucoma, but they have narrow angle at the prison. They have a wide or normal depth of the anterior chamber at the center, but they have a shallow, crowded angle. So they are misleading. Actually, young age, myopic, and you find the central AC depth is fine. Usually, you don't use uh, gonioscopy routinely, but this is the cases which are missed and discovered later. Here is a plateau iris configuration due to anterior rotation of the cerebral body. The angle becomes a crowded. You can see that here the central AC depth is fine, is normal, is normal, but the angle entry is very narrow, and they are very difficult to manage actually. Uh, during uh, during uh, gonioscopy, you will see a double hump sign, which due to indentation of the uh, iris by the anterior surface of the, of the cerebral body at the periphery and the anterior uh, and the central part of the iris by the, by the anterior surface of the iris, a double hump side. Actually, that iris syndrome is only diagnosed after doing an aerodotomy. It's a form of angle closure glaucoma. So our first option is to do PI. Usually they don't respond because of the crowded at the angle. Next is laser peripheral aerotoplasty. I do it regularly in these cases, and they work very nicely. But the trouble is that they need to be repeated every now and then, six months, one year, or two years. You find the pressure builds up again, and you need to repeat the process. 
why you can be in this useful, in this case, what is not available nowadays, but it is very useful because they put iron screw away from the angle. When you say nucleolysis, if you are doing cataract surgery, it will enlarge the angle a little bit because still there is a severe body rotation. It is not the lens that causes the narrow angle, it is the severe body itself. But when you say nucleolysis, it is useful in these cases as well as cataract surgery and trials. But still, one of the most difficult cases to manage is platoaris. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. We are going to show you to Muhammad Desa. We are going to show you a different program. We are going to show you tips and tricks. some difficulties. So I am sharing with you some tips and tricks in the diagnosis of glaucoma. You all know that glaucoma is one of the leading causes of irreversible blindness and it is the second leading cause of blindness all over the world. Glaucoma causes progressive loss of vision till the sad end of complete blindness. And glaucoma, once diagnosed, it has a very bad burden on the modality of life of the patient. It has a serious impact on this quality of life. This serious impact on quality of life resulted from the difficulties from the glaucoma itself in uh, appreciating some important visual functions like reading, uh, adaptation from light to dark, walking alone, driving safely, all this may be affected in late stages of glaucoma. Also, what makes it a burden of the glaucoma difficult for the patient, and your diagnosis may turn them upside down, is uh, uh, the misdiagnosis of glaucoma in, in, uh, in several cases. Sometimes the intolerance to medication is impossible, and the patient develops redness and severe allergy from the medication, and it is difficult for every one of us to have a medicine throughout his life. This is a very serious decision. So we have to be sure of our diagnosis of glaucoma, and to reach this sure diagnosis, we have to have compressive, a comprehensive diagnosis of the optic disc, because glaucoma is really a chronic optic neuropathy. Damage of the optic disc in glaucoma is characteristic, and we have to search for the characteristic signs in the optic disc for the glaucoma. Of course, measuring the intraocular pressure is important, but it's so, sometimes misleading. Sometimes many of your patients coming on treatment and you don't know whether the low intraocular pressure recorded is due to treatment or due to non glaucomatous cases. And you know that uh, intraocular pressure is fluctuating. Most of glaucoma patients may present during the normal phase of their intraocular pressure. It is proved in studies that 40% of patients with primary open angle glaucoma will present to, to you with non-elevated intraocular pressure or intraocular pressure in the normal range. On the reverse, 40% of the cases diagnosed as glaucoma are really not glaucomatous. So you have to pay some attention for the diagnosis of glaucoma. This attention starts by taking a careful history from the patient. 
and then be meticulous in your examination for the glaucoma signs, and then do investigations to confirm your diagnosis. What about the history? You have to ask the patient several questions about his ophthalmic condition in the present and the past. And you have to ask him for the medication he used to control his glaucoma, or the medication used for controlling his blood pressure, if he used a systemic beta blocker, because it caused false lowering of the intraocular pressure. And of course, you have to stress the use of corticosteroids in these patients. Socioeconomic factors are very important in tracing glaucoma and follow-up of glaucoma cases because if you don't consider that, you will lose the follow-up of your patient because of the socioeconomic factors. Of course, uh, family history of glaucoma is a main risk factor and you should ask about this. Then you have to assess the risk factors in these patients. I mean by risk factors, you have to consider the age of the patient, the race of the patient, the possibility of other accidents that occur like hemo, uh, hemodialytic crisis or uh, severe blood loss. Ask about these risk factors in order to assess this condition. We have to consider the age carefully because younger patients if they decided to be a glaucoma, if you decide that they are glaucomatous, they will suffer very long life with the suffering of glaucoma itself and the suffering of the complications of drugs. Previous medication like corticosteroids are very important. The, any trauma or surgery or laser done in the past is very important. Concomitant diseases with microvascular natures like diabetes is very important and also the hemodynamic crisis or any diagnosis that may simulate optic uh, neuropathy of glaucoma like ischemic optic neuropathy. Ask about an attack of acute anger, uh, elevation of intraocular pressure. This is always misdiagnosed as, my, as migraine, tension, headache, meningitis, or psychomotor disorders, but it might be transient elevations of intraocular pressure. So ask about intermittent episodic blurring, colored halos around light, transient ocular pain, frontal headache, nausea and malaise that may occur sporadically. Then careful examination will detect the glaucoma from the non-glaucoma. Of course, careful examination include intraocular pressure measurement, anterior segment assessment, gonioscopy, examination of the optic nerve head and examination of the retina and nerve fiber layer, visual field examination, and central corneal thickness. What about the intraocular pressure measurement? Be careful that the intraocular pressure measurement is sometimes tricky because you have diurnal variations and you might have some corneal abnormality that interfere in your measurement. The intraocular pressure is affected by the blood pressure and intra-abdominal pressure. You have to consider the age, the lifestyle of the patient, if he suffers from uh, elevations during exercise or uh, elevation during changing of the posture. So we have some tips and tricks in measurement of intraocular pressure. First of all, instruct the patient to loosen the, his tie and open this tight shirt because this will uh, affect the measurement of intraocular pressure. Some patients, while you are measuring, are holding their breath and this will elevate the intraocular pressure. Try to relax the patient during the measurement. And you have to adjust the dial and adjust your uh, apparatus before starting the test to get uh, normal uh, assessment of the intraocular pressure. And look carefully for the end point and measure several times and get the average. Don't rush to measure the intraocular pressure once 
and uh, say it is 21 and 22 and 23 without repeating the measurement in a short time to get the average and not to overshoot the uh, results. Of course, there are key, rem uh, key reminders in the measurement that may cause errors in the measurement of intraocular pressure by ablation phenomenon. You may have higher readings with excessive fluorescein from the eye, eyelid pressure by your fingers. Uh, in my patients, I try to measure by ablation tonometry without touching the patient. If you explain the test for the patient and get his confidence, he will open his eye and you can measure the intraocular pressure without touching the eyelid to open them widely because this opening widely may press on the eye and elevate the intraocular pressure. Of course, be, be aware about the patient's training during the examination and be careful in examining intraocular pressure in obese short neck patients and uh, you have to examine the anterior segment first because if the patient suffers from lens corneal or intracorneal intraocular lens corneal acquisition, there will be false high reading of intraocular pressure. Technical difficulties, you, you may find patient with nystagmus or patient with very narrow palpebral vision, patient with tremors, and patient with marked or corneal astigmatism or corneal abnormalities like scar in the graft, edema, keratoconus, or patient doing LASIK, all these you should consider the corneal abnormality present before measuring the intraocular pressure. Then, don't depend altogether on intraocular pressure. If the intraocular pressure is normal, the patient may still be glaucomatous. So you have to assess the anterior segment and do gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is very important, but always missed. Many, many of our uh, colleagues uh, are reluctant to do gonioscopy to their glaucoma patients, not to the normal patients either. But gonioscopy allows us to determine the, the, the topography of the anterior chamber angle and differentiate between the types of glaucoma. There are tips in doing gonioscopy. Here, using one mirror lens is much easier than using the four mirror lens in examining the, uh, the angle. Well, uh, you, you, you should use the slit lamp with indirect lens. I prefer the one mirror lens of the Goldman. Turn the illumination da down because bright illumination may constrict the pupil and open the angle falsely. Shorten and narrow the slit beam in examining the angle of the anterior chamber and look for any subtle changes in the angle. In your examination, avoid entering light through the pupil because the pupil will constrict and this will reopen the angle falsely. If you have good suspicion of angle closure, turn the light off and wait for two or three minutes till the condition is adapted to the dark light and then re-examine the angle. In examination of the angle, you should follow certain steps. You know that the inferior angle is the widest angle and the easiest to see. So start with the mirror up. And then the second step is to examine with the mirror down. And then you move to the nasal and the temporal. Every quadrant should respect it in examination of the angle of the anterior chamber. And you should uh, have a sketch of the angle on a diagram, we call it the goniogram, and this goniogram should be kept in the file of each glaucoma patient. In presence of a positional closure, you have to do indentation gonioscopy, and indentation gonioscopy should be done by a small gonio lens. Of course, the Goldman, one mirror lens is a large lens, and you cannot make central pressure with it. So if you want to do careful indentation gonioscopy, you should shift to the Zeiss or mirror lens. 
This is very important to differentiate between acquisitional closure and synechial closure, which include, which uh, have peripheral anterior synechia in the end. Of course, it is uh, a trick to shift the angle of your view during doing gonioscopy. You have to alter the position of the mirror or the position of your gaze in cases of uh, iris bombay in order to look directly inside the angle of the anterior chamber. This is the idea of indentation gonioscopy. Pressure by the, uh, by the lens on the central part of the cornea will push the echoes to the angles, reopen the angles, and detect any subtle synechia in these angles. Of course, this is a closed angle, and by indentation, it is reopened. Angle closure signs include peripheral anterior synechia, pigment patches over the trabecular meshwork, and abnormal iris insertion. But in open angles also, you can find pigmentary glaucoma, pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma, vessels, or perceptors. While ciliary band in gonioscopy may indicate angle recession or cyclodialysis, cyclodialysis clip. This is an angle with synechia, and this is the histological and the UPM picture. And thank you very much for your attention.